this on? Oh, okay. Well, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Chris Jones. I'm with Bloomberg, and we're going to talk about some of the things with scaling uh, uh, Ceph in this case. If I can get it to work. All right. Real quick, uh, 30 years and under 30 seconds, we are primar primarily a uh, financial services provider. And you can see our uh, Bloomberg terminal there. It has over 60,000 functions and does a tremendous amount of things for the financial market, including data streams, et cetera. So what do we use um, of Ceph? We use the, the object store, the block volume, and we also, with the OpenStack side, we just started using ephemeral storage. One of the guys here that worked on that is here. And I believe that the ephemeral storage has now become one of the more popular uh, things that we offer, which is kind of cool. We actually, um, I, th I guess it was at Vancouver last year that we saw that, and so we went back and kind of implemented it. Now, we... It, it talks about hyperconverged. We were kind of hyperconverged before it was cool. You know, everything now is 100% buzzword compliant with hyperconverged this, super hyperconverged, you name it. But we started doing that, oh, probably three years ago, and where we had everything on, um, for example, head nodes. And head nodes are controllers in the OpenStack world. But then we had not only that, we were running MONs, uh, OSDs, you name it, and those same things. And that started becoming a problem. So this past year, we kind of re-architected it a little bit and went to a pod architecture. And that gave us the abilities to scale out, do different things of that nature. So we can actually have three of these uh, per rack. Now you see there in the middle, it talks about a tour. So not only, we actually put those with each bundle, with each pod. And so you can actually make tweaks. We can do things. We can scale uh, however we want to within the data center, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it gives us a lot of flexibility to do that. But what we were seeing is that uh, our object store was actually becoming very popular. So we wanted to scale that. But the problem was we could, didn't want to have, you know, have uh, a massive amount of compute space because of the, the fact that it was so expensive because all of our nodes are running SSDs. All our whole Ceph cluster is SSDs. I mentioned a while ago the ephemeral piece, and you can get an idea, so I'll give you a little bit of a, a visual on it, because I'm kind of a visual guy. But the, if you're using the Ceph side, and then you're looking at the ephemeral, then uh, you can see that there's a lot more network traffic, et cetera, et cetera. But there has, you know, there's a lot of trade-offs. Like with Ceph, it's safe from, you know, in this particular standpoint. So if uh, one of our customers stands up however many VMs, et cetera, et cetera, they're okay. But with ephemeral, but it's a little slower. But with the ephemeral side, it's kind of, it's, it's a lot faster. And we kind of look at that and say, okay, are you going to live life dangerously because of the fact that, you know, it could go away at any time. Now, the numbers here don't represent actual, don't, don't look at them and say, oh, this is what they, this is what they find on their production cluster, because that's not true. These are actually uh, done with some of our lab equipment, and some of it's old. So let's look at some of the comparisons between it. And so when you look at this, compare, like, do I run Ceph with everything, or do I uh, mix in some ephemeral, et cetera? So, we get into the thing that we're doing right now, which is the object store. The object store, we started kind of breaking that out. And so what we're doing now is uh, we have, basically we start out with three racks. And our, our initial piece where we had it is, uh, we had a, a hardware load balancers, but now we're actually, uh, don't, we've actually created our own custom load balancers. Now, in that case, and also the other thing to, I don't have a pointer, but one of the things to remember is each one of these racks are routed. They're on their own subnet. So you get into a situation with, like, for example, with Keep Alive D, that it doesn't want to, you know, transfer over the IPs, et cetera. 
the, the, the VIP, but the fact is it's there. So we, we fix that with other configurations. And I'll show you that in a minute. So the, our OpenStack cluster runs uh, on Ubuntu, but our object store actually runs on Rail. Now there's no particular reason why we did that. It was more, oh thank you, there was more or less an olive branch because we have a lot of storage groups, we have a lot of other groups within the company, and a lot of those guys just, they use rail. And so they're comfortable with it. And so I wanted to get more of these guys involved so that it would help us, especially with the ops side of it, because I didn't want to sit and do ops stuff all the time. And so I got those guys involved, so we, we basically put it on rail. Now, in this, you see that the top part uh, is our tour, uh, and then, of course, then we have three 1U nodes. Now, the 1U nodes are uh, going to be, they're basically our mon nodes, they are uh, our radius gateway, and uh, our load balancers. And then the other 17 are 2U nodes, and those are all of our OSD nodes. Now, that's important because I just came from a talk, which was a, a great talk, uh, from Comcast, and they actually are running uh, large density servers, and I think roughly about 72 drives per one. In our case, we actually have tw 12 drives in this, 12 spinners, and they're six terabyte drives, and then we have two uh, SSD journals. Now, the, the interesting thing about that is that they're not, those SSDs, are not just the journals, they're actually, they're co-located or co-hosting, so to speak, with the OS itself. So basically a small portion of the first top of it is actually the, the OS rated to the second, and then we have six journals on one S SSD and six journals on the other. Now, and then the journal sizes are larger. We went a little larger on our journal sizes because we had the space. And so they're running at uh, 20, uh, 20 gig. Also, uh, our interface is we have two NICs, uh, or two ports. Uh, one's uh, for our cluster size, it's 10 gig, and one for our public is 10 gig. Now, Redis gateways and MONs don't use the, the cluster side. So the only thing that they, are, they actually do is the, the, the public side. So in that case, we're actually bonding those. And then we're bonding them in a, uh, basically LACP mode, so it's mode four, so we can get some aggregate pieces out of them. This is pretty much some of the things we talked about, but one of the things I skipped over there, I was gonna talk about a little over here, is to actually get scale, we are, are currently our OS, I mean our OpenStack ones are running all replicas, three replicas on straight SSDs. But with the uh, object store, what we've done is it's all erasure coding. And come to find out, we've, what we're doing with eraser coding, you know, there's not a whole lot of uh, docs out there. There's not a good explanation of why you do this, why you don't do this, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of this stuff was trial and error, uh, and then of course bringing in some folks from Red Hat uh, to take a look at it and see, and then we came up with some combinations from there. But the interesting thing too, on the Redis Gateway side, is you know if you've ever created a Redis Gateway, it creates a pool set, uh, roughly about 14 pools approximately, and each of those you know, has some sort of function within Rados Gateway. The, the, the most important one is the, the bucket pool, the Rados, the dot RGW dot bucket. That is the only one that you actually do erasure coding on. The rest of them are actually replicas. And you'll see some of that here in a minute and what I'm talking about. Also, too, the, another important thing that we, we've done, and it was also mentioned in the other talk, too, is the OSD nodes we run a hardware uh, controllers on because there was a significant performance uh, increase if you try to do software pieces or onboard controllers, et cetera. We actually, uh, one of the guys here actually started doing some testing with some new equipment. They got it in, and apparently we, somewhere along the lines, we didn't have a controller and they were like, hey, why are these drives and everything supposedly better and all this other stuff, but it's slower than our current uh, architecture? And then we got in and started digging, or he did primarily, and realized that, oh, we don't have our controller. So we wasn't doing apples and apples comparison and it was a significant performance increase. 
So this gives you more of a logical view of how we have our object store. We have our spines, but then we're also, and we have our two uh, load balancers. Now, the interesting thing, like I said before, with Keep Alive D is the fact that you can't really span multiple subnets in this particular case. So you will see, uh, if you do like an IP space A on the first load balancer and you do the one on the second one, you'll see the, the VIPs over there, whatever, however many VIPs that you may have. The difference is we're, go we're now going to use BGP that's going to advertise these routes, and we use BIRD for that. Because uh, everything we're doing, we're trying to stay in a, um, uh, an open source or basically a non-vendor solution. That's where we're heading. We're trying to get everything toward a non-vendor solution. So we set up the uh, bird on the BGP so that it advertises to its peers, and its peers are the spines. And then the rest of the network can recognize where they are. Now, in doing that, we don't want to advertise the secondary because it will get confused. And what will happen, because it did, and what happens is that when you start doing, um, doing Redis gateway calls, you start doing different things, you'll see just connections will drop. And what it was, it was the routes and everything else was getting confused. So there was, there's a configuration setting that you can do in Bird, which basically makes this a secondary advertiser instead of a primary. And so that worked out pretty good. Now. The Rados Gateway, we run multiple instances of Rados Gateway per Rados Gateway node. And remember, it's a, two, it's a, it's a one U box. It has uh, two uh, 10 gig ports, and it has 256 gigs of RAM. Now, the original piece called for 128 gigs, but when they came in, they had 256, and I wasn't going to turn it away. So I kept it. And I just didn't say anything. Life's good. So we were kind of looking at that and said, hey, why don't we start doing something a little different? We can actually approach this a little different. And so in that case, we started doing some investigating on how can we run multiple instances of Rados Gateway on a single node, but yet split it out from a standpoint of, uh, and, and the reason for this is we have, what's, uh, we have private networks in, in our group. So in that, we can't let this private network see what's going over in this private network, et cetera. And so typically, all of our clusters are inside a private network within itself. So if the private network A wants a cluster, then we have to build out a whole cluster. Because there's, from security standpoints in the past, the way it was all worked out, you couldn't do that. You couldn't say, well, here's a converged piece of hardware. Why don't you all come into to that? So, but with the object store, that's the very first product within Bloomberg that's been allowed to do that. So we have now a, uh, a centralized server cluster that now takes access from uh, private network A, private network B, C, D, whatever. And so each one of those uh, Rados gateway boxes are also weighted. And so and the reason for that is uh, we want to be able to uh, scale them out if we need to or if we have failures. We can set up, uh, for example, we can set up uh, uh, OSD nodes as a lower weighted Rados gateway if we have to. And the same goes for other things too, even MONs. Uh, and, and you can see that in here in just a bit. So uh, each one of the uh, load balancers basically weights this, puts it on a different port for if, if the VIP is uh, coming in off of private network A, it goes over here, and it goes to a different port if it's private network B. Now, here's some important configuration uh, pieces. The, you know, it was pointed out in the last section that um, Ceph, you know, it has, I don't know how many, but I mean, it has so many knobs you can't even count. And so, so you, you do this, you do that, and you turn one over here, something else happens, you, you're kind of like, oh, what's, you know, this doesn't make sense sometimes, and sometimes it does. So uh, you have to actually tune it for your given environment. So one of the things that we've, like in what I was telling you before, is each rack is on its own subnet. Cool thing, you know, uh, because all the examples you see show it in one aggregate, like a slash 24, whatever, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, we actually have it in slash 27s uh, for that, and they're all routed, all routable. On our OSDs, 
we, um, uh, those are all XFS uh, with onboard controllers like we talked about. And then our radius gateway components, one of the things that we're testing right now, we haven't implemented it yet, but what we're testing is the federation uh, with regions and zones. And we've got another cluster that we're about to stand up so we can do that. And then, of course, the eraser coding pieces. And the thing to keep in, in mind about eraser coding, it, it's different than replicas. Replicas is like dead, dead simple. I mean, you got one object, another object, and another object. Eraser coding is different. The crush maps are different. Everything about it from that standpoint is different. And so you actually have to have a reasonably good uh, custom crush map. And so we have two rules that we created. One is for the replicated and one's for the erasure. And what we've done is we've done it by racks and then by hosts, then by OSDs so that we can kind of distribute the load. Because the whole thing about Ceph is data distribution. That's the whole point. Because you don't want a rack being full over here, or almost full, and then you have two other racks, three other racks, or whatever, and they are not completely full, but you're kind of like, why are all this, this uh, funky stuff going on? Well, and this comes back to the crush map. And also, too, one thing to keep in mind, and, and I would recommend this with almost any um, uh, configuration is to do sharding on your bucket indexes. Now that, that's an interesting thing and the way it works is that uh, there's a setting, I think it's yeah right below there, that you just basically tell it like a max shard of five. Now that five is just a, a sample and you're going to see something too because everything we do is all open source. All everything is open source except for the data of our given machines itself, such as the MAC addresses and IPs and all the other good stuff. But everything else is open source. But you can take it, so you may do some uh, of your buckets, you may have it set at five, and then you say, oh, you know, I need to go up a little higher, and then you set it to 10, but your previous, all your other component buckets that you had, uh, or buckets are actually pools in this, this particular case, uh, or buckets, and they'll all still be at five, but all your new ones will take on the, the new configuration. So it's not going to go back and change any of the old stuff. Also, Civet Web, uh, we kind of booted Apache out. Uh, it was a memory hog and a lot of other things. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, the front end pieces. Now, this is an interesting little piece because a lot of people don't know about it or know that you can do it. it it's really nothing. Um, that is just left out of docs. And that is, you could, there's, CivetWeb itself has a lot of options. It has a lot of different config settings that you can do. You just have to go look at the CivetWeb project. And then you start seeing all those different components. So then you come back, you look at some of the code within Redis Gateway, and then you say, oh, I can use that, I can use that. The one there that says number of threads equal 100, that's actually a default setting. We were playing, or I was playing, with increasing, decreasing, looking to see what happened, et cetera, but then I just left it in there. But that actually 100 is the default setting within CivetWeb. Network. All right, most everything you'll find performance-wise basically uh, falls into these two pieces, the load balancers and your network. The, like I said before, the radius gateways of the MONs and the load balancers all are bonded. We had two 10 gig ports, and they're bonded with uh, uh, mode four for aggregate in this particular case. Also, we're using jumbo frames. Uh, so we set the MTU to 9,000. Definitely you want to do that on your cluster piece. That's a, that's a given. And the reason, one of the reasons for that is last year we were doing some testing um, on our uh, clusters that were in our DMZ, and I was comparing it to uh, S3. And I had to do that because one of our customers was doing stuff and said, hey, we're going to move over here, we're going to do this, whatever. And so we needed to get good benchmarking. I think it was uh, Canonical uh, yesterday in here was talking about that when you're doing comparisons of look with your storage uh, cost-wise, you want to, uh, it doesn't really matter what's going on everywhere. You, you need to base your cost off of what's Amazon doing. That needs to be your baseline. And the reality is, for us, not only was it the cost that we had to look at for baseline the price, but we also had to look at the performance because of our customers say, hey, I get faster doing this or I get faster over here. Now, that's only in, like I said, our, our DMZ side. We have many, many uh, private secure networks, and so 
that that's not, never a factor in, in that particular case, but on the other side it is. Now, if you do, you know, oh, and the other thing about the MTU 9000, so I had problems last year. So it basically takes a cloud to test the cloud. So I was testing a, a lot of different things with JMeter from Amazon back into uh, our cluster and then from Amazon to S3. And by the tweaks that we made with Redis Gateway, I had parity with S3. And so the irony was I'm on a EC2 comparing myself, coming back to our uh, DMZ, and then going to a close region uh, for, EC, for S3, and I was on parity performance-wise. But we also saw some things dropping along the way, and it was because of the fact that the discovery modes on some of the devices, et cetera, et cetera, wherever they may be, were not doing what they're supposed to do, which is auto-adjusting the MTU, uh, from in that standpoint, and so we just went ahead and set it at 1500 uh, on our public side. The, the config setting that I talked about earlier with Bird is like on that bottom line there. It's talking about setting secondary nodes with your ASN, and this is real important if you're never doing any BGP stuff because you want to make sure your routes are advertised correctly. Now, uh, obviously, everything we do, I mean, we can't even approach this without automation. There is just absolutely no way. Uh, the last talk, they were talking about, you know, it was tweaking um, this hardware to this hardware and this hardware. And again, it was a density node, and those were purpose-built components. And you had the time. In our case, we're using lower density because I don't care if a machine dies. I don't care. Throw another one in. You file a ticket, get it in. I don't care if a drive fails file a ticket, get it in. So we have spares for those very reasons to do that. And so we're not tweaking all the hardware everywhere we can unless it can be fully automated. If it can be fully automated and it makes sense, then we definitely do that. So the, and all of this stuff is in Chef. Now, you see the first one there, that's our Bloomberg OpenStack. Uh, it was originally called BCPC, it's still called that, but it's made about 400 other changes and names and stuff. So it's BCC now for Bloomberg uh, Cloud Compute, uh, because, and then we've matched with our Bloomberg Object Storage to Bloomberg, Bloomberg Cloud Storage. And so if you see, if you go to the GitHub up there, you can actually, uh, Go ahead and clone it. Even you can do it right now. I did it a while ago in the other talk because I was just testing the performance of the network and all that. And I even built a Ceph cluster on the lap, this laptop while I was sitting in the other uh, session. So you can clone it. Uh, you can build you uh, and then basically uh, run the, the Vagrant up. Uh, or actually there's a couple other things that you would do. And that would build out a full open stack along with Ceph in, in that particular stereo. The, the other interesting thing uh, here, if you look at the second one, that's Ceph Chef. Now that, and if you look at the, the, the GitHub on that, that's actually managed at the Ceph uh, repo. And we actually, we created it, and we basically are the admins for that. And so, uh, and that is a complete uh, cookbook that will give you uh, everything that you see here, uh, plus more uh, for everything, including uh, CephFS, et cetera. So, and then the next piece is our object store, which I'm talking about, and that actually implements the Ceph Chef. So, in essence, what the the sec, the, uh, the the Chef BCS does is it actually uh, when you basically say Ceph up, in this case for a development environment, because we do everything on VirtualBox for our development, and then we roll it into our hardware side of it. It will actually go out, grab all the cookbook, grab all the dependencies, grab all the packages, everything it needs, because in our scenario, we cannot out, uh, access the outside world. So but for security reasons, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we operate behind lots of proxies and you name it. And in, like I said, all of this stuff is on GitHub, completely free, go out and get it right now. Actually, that would be awesome. And, and issue some pull requests, that'd be really good because there's a lot of enhancements out there that uh, need to be made to everything. Uh, so here it, it talks about, again, the, uh, just so you know, I wasn't kidding, here's a screenshot uh, of the actual GitHub page. Uh, the same here for the cloud storage. 
uh, and then our uh, BCPC. Now this is a much larger project, obviously, because it has all of the uh, OpenStack components, et cetera. Uh, but again, uh, it has the configurations and things necessary to build up full clusters. Because I don't want to, uh, like in the, the storage side, I don't want to build one way on hardware over here on Vagrant and all this other stuff and then do something different, uh, completely different on the hardware. So we try to keep everything as close as possible, but there's some, some challenges with that too, especially when you get into the networking side. So that you can't do with the, the virtual box side of it. And then you actually have to say, hey, I've got to actually put this on hardware to see what happens. Now, this is something I added. Um, so if you, because this question gets asked a whole lot on eraser coding, how much capacity will I get uh, if I do eraser coding versus replicas? So I'm like, uh, a lot? I don't know. How much are you going to do? I don't know. I, I can't answer that. So I, I got a little tired of kind of answering that question or not answering that question. And so I thought, you know what? I'm just going to create and then go through the formulas, set it up so that you can actually plug in the number of OSDs you're going to have, what size they're going to be, et cetera, show you what your raw compute size is, and then allow you to do what-if scenarios where you can look at your K side and your M side uh, and then kind of uh, trigger out where you kind of balance where you want these erasure code settings to be. That's also in the GitHub repo. So you can actually go and download it right now and start playing with it. Now, the interesting thing here, if you see, and, and this gives you a better visual, because I'm visual, so it gives me a better picture of what my capacity is going to be. So for example, I know if I increase my K or decrease my M, then I'm going to better utilize my storage. But there's trade-offs there. Remember when I was talking about replicas were something, you know, hey, copy A, B, and C, simple, no problem. The erasure coding takes, for example, if I have, and this uses 10 for uh, easy math, and I have a 10 gig file that I, I, I have out there, and then I say, okay, I'm going to do a K of, say, 5, or any, any of those, really, in that, in that case, then that 10 gig gets split into 10 evenly, uh, into basically the number of Ks, in this case, 10. So now I have 10 objects that are going to be floating around the storage. I have to do something with that. I've got to balance it because it's distributed. And so then it allows me to look at this because I have to look at those two values to determine how I want my crush map to look like. Because you can't just go and use the default crush map or you can't use a simple one that says, uh, okay, step, choose, leaf, uh, blah, 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 rack you know, tight rack, and it's, it's going to make it where everything looks good, failure uh, domains, et cetera. It won't work because you'll go to imp uh, implement this and you'll say, why aren't any pools being created? And the reason is because the crush map is looking for K number of whatever you told it to look for. Do you have K number of racks? Do you have K number of hoses? Things of this nature, depending on what your failure domain is in your erasure coded profile. And this gives you the abilities to say, okay, I'm going to trade off uh, a given pool for whatever reason uh, so I can actually maximize my, make my storage more efficient, or I want to see something a, a little different. And, Let's see if I can go back to that. Okay. Well, one thing I, I didn't mention was the on the M side, this is important because those are your parity chunks. So uh, it takes the, the, say in the scenario I have my 10 gig, it takes that, divides that, for example, by K, and then it'll add any buffering so it's all even. And so you've got a 1 gig, a 10 1 gigs, but then all of a sudden, but let's say I have 5 set at my M, on my M side, that's my parity side, you're also going to see five one gig uh, pieces or other chunks. So you're going to have a total of 15 that are floating around out there. The, this gives you kind of a, what I was talking about before. Uh, and, and this actually, uh, the, these numbers, this percentage wise, are actually taken from the PG cal calculator. You know, you go to CEF.com slash pgcalc, and you can go in there and kind of set and play with, okay, how do I look and set up my pools uh, or my, and my PGs and things of this nature. 
and inside, uh, inside the uh, cookbook it sells too, it actually implements the, that same PG calculator inside the cookbook, uh, but it gives you another option because instead of going to the nearest power two, you can also say, hey, I want to go to a higher power two, so you have the option to do whichever way you want, and that will actually help you with your PG distribution. But the, you can see the amount of data that each of these pools in a, a typical, just plain, simple, out of the box, Rados Gateway pool set. Uh, the, it's 96.9% uh, of that data is stored in your buckets. Now, it's not, you, you could probably get away with some of the others being eraser coded too, but this is the recommended way of doing it, where only the uh, actual buckets themselves are eraser coded, everything else is replicated. So, the, okay, so now you're kind of looking at eraser coding because I know everybody wants to maximize their dollars. They want to maximize, but they don't have a whole lot of information on it. It sounds really complicated, et cetera. Uh, and, and it sort of kind of is when you start to look at it at the first time, but then when you start working through and looking at how the objects are laid out within Ceph, it begins making a lot of sense. And so it becomes more and more clear, and then you can actually begin doing some really neat things with your crush map and distributing your load a lot better. You, and the main thing too with your erasure coding uh, pieces is think about your failure domains. Like for example, a typical failure domain in the replica is a rack. That's a typical thing uh, that people try to do. Is, hey, I can lose a rack or whatever and, and it doesn't bother me. So, but with erasure coding, that's not going to be your failure domain, most likely. Uh, it definitely won't unless you have a whole lot of racks. So um, in this particular case, our failure domain is, is a node, an actual storage node. You can make them as OSD or at different pieces. And so what happens, is the reason why that's important is because your crush map and all that will try to basically keep going out so it doesn't repeat an object, of in one of those uh, aggregate objects inside of the same host. Now that would be horrible, horrible. Because what happens when that host goes out? Well, you just, you just lost, you lost your data. So instead, uh, it will actually try to disperse that, et cetera. So there's a couple different ways to kind of check on this, play with it, see, see the settings, et cetera. Uh, one is, again, you set your profiles. You can set as many of these profiles as you want. The default, too, on these, all of these defaults are, for example, the plugin is uh, J Eraser, but you can, you can change that. Uh, I left it at J Eraser in that particular case. Uh, and so you can set these values like 10, like I was in that scenario I was just talking about, and I set a, the uh, failure domain to host. You could create multiples of them, it doesn't matter. They're just profiles, nothing happens at this stage. Then you come down, now when, what I like to do, because we manage our whole crush map itself, so we set the you know, on start equals false, all that stuff. So, it, because of that, if you start having OSDs go down and start flapping and all that, then you have to kind of roll them a little bit. So I don't like to do that. I don't want to do that. If, if less works better for me. So what I typically do before I do any of this is I'll set the no down in that particular case because I want to keep everything up. I don't want to have to go back and fix it later from me playing with it. And now, of course, that's going to say health warning, but that's because you set a flag. That's the only reason why I would say that. The then you create a pool, and so you create a new pool, add your PGs, your PGSs, and then you give it the name of the profile you just had, and then the name of the crush map uh, rule set that you're going to use. In this case, I'm going to use, uh, and I happen to call it HDD underscore erasure, because the other one is for replicas. Then you, you come down and you start looking at your, you want to get your PG number uh, after, if everything, if it goes out and starts building your pools, uh, and then that, you know, that's good. But you want to see where they're distributed. And because you don't, you want to make sure that you don't have uh, things, like I said, all in one host or even all in one rack. Uh, and uh, because if when it's, it's actually tempting when you say, oh, wow, I got to help. Okay, and on my first erasure coding, cool, great, we still support erasure coding. But then you start looking at it, oh no, uh, everything's in one rack. So if this rack goes out, I'm hosed. So you gotta start playing a little bit. So uh, 
taking the stereo, in this case, you want to look at your pools, your OSD, so Ceph OSD, LS pools, you can do it, you can do an OSD dump on that and just look at the top part as well. And the, the, the PGs and all that are going to be, uh, you know, unique integers, and so, and plus some other things uh, behind the decimal, but the, the, the primary part is the, uh, actually I'm talking about the pool, sorry. And you want to get that, the pool ID, and then you want to do like a PG dump, and then you want to grep on the PG number. Now there's a couple, like I said, there's several different ways you do it. This is the way I do it. And then what that does is that shows me, okay, now I'm only looking at the, my PG map uh, or dump on just the pool I'm interested in. Because it doesn't have any data in it now, but it's going to tell you where it's mapping to what OSDs. And so uh, you'll see something like, uh, like in this case, 10, 0, 5, 2, 12. So it's on uh, basically five, uh, just in this scenario, five uh, OSDs. And then you can find out, you know, do a Ceph OSD find, uh, and then you can find out where, like 10 being the ID of the first OSD, and you can find out what host it's on, which is the rack. And if you segmented your, obviously, your host names properly, which you should do always, uh, and then you'll know what racks, et cetera, are out there. And then you start making adjustments to your crash map based on that because that's where you're going to find where your placements are. And that's, like I said, it's critical. Uh, you can't skip that part because you want to kind of understand where the distributions are. Testing. So um, everything, you know, obviously testing is critical. Uh, with OpenStack, uh, when we first started doing things, it was we've used Tempest, uh, and we actually have Rally inside of our cluster. We don't use it as often now as we did a couple, like last year we used it a little bit. Uh, but on the Ceph side, uh, the Rados bench, obviously, the, the cost bench, uh, and then the FIOs, and, and the reason for some of that is just you want to test, you want to look at your drives, et cetera. But the one that I use the most is JMeter. And the reason I do that is I've set it up in a uh, master-slave configuration so that I have several mini instances that are running, and they're going to be running uh, tests, which are going to query objects and things of this nature, so I'm going to see what's actually like a real use case of... Uh, something that's going on with, and then I'm going to most likely do uh, random, uh, which I do, uh, I actually do range, uh, random uh, byte range requests so that nothing gets, you know, you're, you're not dealing with one, the first 10 of each object or whatever it is you're, you've segmented. Uh, I, I do random in that particular case. And then you can find out where some of your performance bottlenecks are, and again, most of the time you're going to find that it comes back to your network, your load balancers, those are typically there, but then at the same time, if your OSDs are just screaming and doing work, uh, things of this nature, then you're going to see tremendous amounts of latency from there, and that'll help you kind of pinpoint that, uh, along with the other tools. So uh, what are we looking at going forward on some of this stuff? Uh, we're definitely, obviously, always looking for you know, improvements, uh, better monitoring. Uh, even uh, some of DevOps pipelining. And also, too, the one thing about that, the Ceph Chef cookbooks and the BCS is built so that you can build it uh, and, and then plug it right into a uh, pipelining system, something like GoCD or something of that nature, or even Jenkins, but Jenkins doesn't do pipelining all that great. That's a, that's a debate. Don't, don't throw stuff at me. But, uh, and then the, uh, uh, where we're going to is, in essence, Ceph with... Uh, non-vendor solution, storage solutions. So that's kind of where, in the, the, where we're kind of heading with some of this. And so we're definitely looking for uh, performance improvements no matter what. And we're looking at uh, uh, better uh, multi-tenancy capabilities in Joule. Uh, that's where some of, the, some of that's being kind of laid down a little better. We're going to be testing that. And just so you also know, the, so what we have, our typical, our smallest cluster is roughly 3.6 petabytes is our smallest, uh, and so uh, the, I got somebody to uh, agree, he's sitting in the back of the room, and he got, he got it agreed with some others, uh, that, hey, I've got another cluster over here, there's 3.6 petabytes that uh, hasn't been stood up yet. Can I use that as a lab? And uh, they're like, okay, you have 90 days. So I'm like, great. So that's what I'm gonna be doing with it, and testing a lot of these other pieces with it. Uh, as well as enhanced securities. And then also the other thing that we're kind of looking at too is for specific use cases, some of the NVMEs uh, 
that we may be looking at some hot swappable components uh, and in any other high performance type SSDs and controllers, et cetera. And then maybe, and this is just a maybe, with the RDMA pieces so that that way your OSDs can communicate a little faster uh, directly without going through all the tiers the, the, of the networking components, et cetera. And that's it. And here's the, again, I just want to put this back up here. I don't, like, the guy yesterday said something about Twitter. He said, hey, I don't tweet much, but here it is. I'll put some stuff out there. Same here. I don't tweet much. But the findings that I have, the things that I'm allowed to share uh, on our findings with this test clusters, et cetera, uh, I will put it out there. So, and that'll be one way that it'll do it. And then, of course, we'll always continuously be updating. Uh, matter of fact, I just made... Uh, Pull request and uh, and merges this morning on some of the cookbooks, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, questions? Thank you. I'll try to answer them, so I can't guarantee it. Okay. Which version of Ceph you're using? All right. So, we're running beta with our object store right now, and that version is uh, is Hammer. 94.6. So I didn't mention that, but that's what it is. The uh, what we are testing the new cluster is actually going to be Joule. So that's what we're doing on that. Hi. Hey. So your analysis is brilliant. Thank you so much. But what you're using as a hardware is looks like or sound to me is a enterprise grade SSDs, right? It's true. So if someone asks you, for example, telco service provider, hey, I want to swap out, change my tape solution into Ceph-based low-cost storage that cannot be high-end SSDs, right. but regular drives. What will be your input, and what will be the variable that will be added into your analysis? Increase your pain tolerance. <laughs> uh, that's the first thing. No, that's actually true. And the reason I say that, part of this, this talk here is a part of a much larger talk, and it talks about you have to have buy-in along the way. Everybody has to realize you're going to give and take. That's, only, that's, that's just the way it is. And so you've got to be able to change your pain tolerance. So you can get, uh, there, so what you have to look at with, you know, with SSDs, you can talk to some of these vendors that are out here. They know way better than I do. But you have uh, basically, uh, they can only write so many times. And you know your your things of this nature. The mean time between failures is really low on, on consumer grade, but can they be used? Yeah, but I, I, it just really depends on your use case. I mean, just really look at your use case. I'm not saying don't use do it, because you can do anything you want. So, question about the probably the application part. You know, I don't have much experience in eraser core thing, but uh, for application part, when you use that, did you? Uh, use the default uh, bucket type when you in your in your crash map you have to specify like a straw or can you go back to the first I missed that first piece yeah I'm just uh, talking about the question context uh, that was the first part okay I'm, I'm asking about uh, which bucket type did you use uh, for the you know replica based uh, you know pool Algorithm basically, you know, there are a bunch of algorithm list or straw or tree or stuff. Yeah. Because it seems like you have a rack aware crush map definition there. Yeah, so uh, let me pop over here. I don't know if this will work. Can you cut that back on for a second? Let's see. The, uh, so. Here it gives you a, uh, an example of some of the tunes, tunings. We're actually using the second release of the straw calculation for tunables. So this is our base, uh, and, and this, uh, this is actually, because it's the same, uh, this is actually our base that's in production and what we start with. Uh, and so you'll see the rule sets uh, coming down for the, uh, okay. the different pieces. And then you'll also see uh, different, and, and actually, the bottom one down there with the, you know, with the minus three, et cetera, that's, that's actually not in our production piece. I was actually just testing some stuff on Vagrant this morning uh, the, on that build. Okay. So, um, but from there, what happens is, in the, uh, uh, the Ceph Chef piece, in the OSD sections, if you have a racer coded enabled in the cookbook, 
then what it does is it moves the OS, when it creates the OSD, it moves that into the appropriate slot uh, inside your crush map tree. And then it balances based on those weights on the rack and then the, the nodes, et cetera. Yeah, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, so I was wondering, in my company we have a really bad, we're starting to put stuff in production and our network is very slow. Is there any point in your opinion to tune the performance when the network is just slow? Like do you think we need to tell, talk to infrastructure to get the network better before doing that? Well, yeah, on that one. <laughs> no, no, I know. I but would like, get everything I could get, yeah. No, but like do you think it makes any sense to do performance tuning now and then wait for them to fix network or just fix network right now? and then do performance tuning it after. Well, so that's a good question. So in essence, what you can do right now without trying to do any tuning, get a baseline with what you have. You get a baseline on your performance, you get a baseline on how you're delivering everything, and then from there, start tweaking it a little bit and see if wh where the deltas are between your, but from where, you, where your tweaks are, hopefully they're in a positive direction and not a negative direction, and then you can actually compare that, and so then you have a better idea that when this, uh, you get better uh, throughput, et cetera, et cetera, and you have a little lower latency network, then you're going to be able to take advantage of it immediately. Okay, so you think it's like predictable? Because I was worried when you said you're playing with so many knobs that, you know, maybe the, the reaction will change when the network changes. Um, no, you actually, it should be to the, to the good side of that. Okay. So definitely uh, on that side of it. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Okay, great, thanks.